Hey guys, welcome to the lighthouse. We want you to not watch service alone, but tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend. So share it on all of your social media platforms and even start a watch party. Um, let's see, service is about to start, so tune in now. Welcome, we'll welcome, welcome, Lighthouse Nation. It's good to be in the presence of God once again. Uh, we want to welcome you into this place on today. God is so great, and he is greatly to be praised. We're going to go into prayer on today because we know that God is able to do all things. Philippians 4.13 says he can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. So let us bow as we go into prayer on today. Father God, we come right now first and foremost. We just want to tell you thank you, God. God, we're so grateful, God, that you allowed us another opportunity just to be in your presence. God, we're thankful because you're amazing, God, because we've seen you do things that we know that it was only by your grace that we still here. So God, right now, we invite your spirit into this place, Father God. Cleanse our hearts, cleanse our minds, Father God. Allow us to be more like you, Father God. Let us know, Father God, that even through the pandemic, God, the sun is still shining because you're still here. So God, we love you right now, Father God. We thank you right now, Father God. We exalt you in this place on today. God, I pray that you supply every need right now, Father God. Whether it's a healing that we need, we know that you're able. God right now whether it's finances God we know that you're able God we know father God that for every layoff God there's gonna be a bigger payoff right now God and we thank you right now God because you're awesome God because you're worthy God we magnify your name right now so come into this place God clean up our hearts father God allow us to be more like you father God father allow us to follow your direction and not our own father God Sit us down right now, Father God, and rest us in your perfect peace, God. We love you, God, right now. We honor you right now, Father God. We thank you right now, Father God. Just give him some praise right now because he's worthy. Just give him some praise right now because he's worthy. Give him some praise because he's worthy. And most of all, God, we just lift you up. God, it's in the mighty name of Jesus. We do pray and we give thanks. Amen. Can we just give God the highest praise? I feel a sense of freedom in the atmosphere. I don't care where you are on your couch, in your homes, in the kitchen. Get up with us because there's a sense of freedom. Look at your neighbor and say, freedom looks good on you. Now clap your hands. Yeah. Come on, let me see those smiling faces. Come on, comment in the section and smile. Come on, freedom. Listen. Sing a little louder than before. Oh, I, I want to clap a little louder than before. Oh, hey, I want to dance a little louder than before. I want to shout a little louder than before. Everybody say, it's all right to move.
I wish I could sing as well as they sing. That was incredible. Praise and worship is one of my favorite things to do. I do it in the car, I do it at home. I thank God that God has given us kind of minstrels and voices that he has. And I hope that that praise and worship moment was enough to lift up your spirits to be able to receive the word that God has given for me, for you. And I am grateful that God continues to speak to us in ways that I've never expected. This Reset series, I don't know what it has done for you, but I know what it's done for me. I believe that it has helped me to recover and to recalibrate and to reset my life, to get it on track, to make sure that COVID-19 or that the social injustice that is taking place in the world will not keep us from ultimately reaching our destiny. So today, in our Reset series, we're going to talk about how to recycle. We're going to talk about how to recycle. And the word of God that I want to use uh, for this picture is found in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 34. Now, I know you know this story, but I pray that I can tell you this story from a different angle. Let's look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Let's look at verse 34 and 35. Perhaps verse 36 as well. 1 Samuel chapter 17, they're going to put it up on the screen if you're ready. Just, I know I can't hear you, but if you're ready, just say go. All right, I heard you. Here's what the word of God says. It says, and David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his sheep, his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. Next verse, verse 35, it says, and I went out after him and smote him, that means to strike, 
and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. That word slew means to kill. Verse 36, thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine <laughs> shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. I love this text. I love this text. The Bible says, and David said unto Saul, this is David talking to Saul. He said, thy servant, thy servant kept his father's sheep. He says, and there came a lion and a bear. And when it came up after what I was watching, it didn't stand a chance because I smote it. I hit it and I killed it. I, I, I don't want you to laugh at my subject today, but today I want to talk to you about this. The little giant. I want to talk about the little giant. I don't know if you have ever seen this movie. Chances are some of you have. But there is a movie out called The Little Giants. And uh, there are two brothers, Danny and Kevin, in the movie. And uh, Danny, um, in the movie, um, has always lived in the shadow of his brother, Kevin. Kevin is a Heisman Trophy winner, uh, and he has a local a peewee football team called the Cowboys. And if you watch this movie, uh, you know that the Cowboys typically win the championship every year. Kevin is the man. He drives around town in a red Corvette. He's got the beautiful wife. Uh, he's a local uh, town hero. He's got a restaurant and uh, food named after him. He, he's the man. Uh, but his brother Kevin isn't viewed in the same way. He's a little short, nerdy looking guy with glasses on and uh, he, he's, he's got a daughter uh, who wants to play on his brother's football team. And guess what? She's the best player on the team. But because um, Kevin doesn't respect the fact that a girl can play football, he actually cuts her from the football team, thereby causing her to be upset and telling her father, and, and the story goes on, the father uh, starts a football team for his daughter, and, and they go up against... Uh, his brother, and they end up winning the championship. The reason why I'm fast-forwarding through this is because I didn't come to preach to you about a movie today. I only used the movie as a backdrop to show you what I'm going to show you in the text. If you want to know the outcome of the movie and the specificity of it, I suggest that you watch it. But it is a story of complete sensible notoriety and, and sensibility because there is this nerdy, glasses-wearing, short, curly-haired guy who is smaller than his big, strong, athletic brother. Somehow, by the end of the story, the little guy beats the big guy. That, that's what I love about this story. The little guy beats the big guy. And the girl who wasn't good enough for the team ends up being the MVP of the league and the and. And, and wins the championship, the, the girl beats the big guy. There was even one scene where this big kid came and he tackled people until he hurt them, but he couldn't do it to this young girl because she was, she was a little giant. And, and, and when I look at this story, it reminds me that even though if you have never seen the little giants, I know that most of you have heard of the story of David and Goliath. David and Goliath is such a fixation in American culture that it has become synonymous for good versus evil. It has become synonymous for top dog versus underdog. It's become synonymous for advantaged versus disadvantaged. It, it has become uh, synonymous for um, the winner versus the loser, because we have stripped this story of its salvific notoriety and have boiled it down into a context that is usable and palatable across all genres of conversation. 
for David is a type of Christ, and this is really a story about biblical biblical proportions, but because it has such significance, we can use it in everyday ordinary language. But I would argue that this story has more than meets the eye. David has had a life filled with ups and downs. His children have had all kinds of issues. He's had relationship issues. On one occasion, two of his wives were kidnapped. He got into a heated battle with one of his sons. David has had a rough life. But the truth is, you may not know anything about Tamar. You may not know anything about Absalom. You may know nothing about the other brothers that he had uh, in front of him for his father to pick, who Samuel would anoint as king. But all of you know about David versus Goliath. Because his battle with Goliath has become the most important story of his life. The battle with Goliath has become the most vigorous part of his conversation, his history, and his destiny. But I would argue that just because this is the most celebrated story of his life, it is not the most consequential story of his life. Oh, everybody knows that he had this battle with this bear. Everybody knows this big man that's, that's nine feet and, and, and has sheaves and, and a sword and a shield. And we all know that David took that slingshot, and what did he do? Hit that giant in the center of the forehead, and we know he killed him with just one shot. But what if I told you that just because it is the biggest moment of his life doesn't mean it is the most consequential moment of his life? What if I told you that we miss the moments of the small because we are so infatuated with the results of the big? Yeah, we wouldn't even know who Joseph was had he not become prime minister. But there were some little things along the way that took place because we talk about how he was the prime minister and we use this subject if you know, if, if what, what you meant for evil, God meant it for good. Yes, that is true. But let's not forget that he was thrown in a pit by some Midianites. And God sent a caravan of people to take him out. He was thrown in the pit by his brothers. And God sent a caravan of Midianites to come and take him out. And then he was at Potiphar's house. And, and somehow God delivered him from that. And then he was put in prison. And God delivered him from that because there are some small things that happened along the way. We talk about the Hebrew boys and how they were caught in the fiery furnace, but some smaller things came before that because they were ripped from their families and and their names were changed from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were their slave names. Their original names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And we know about Daniel, and and we talk about the fact that he was in the lion's den, but his name was Belshazzar, and he lost his whole family to a war because we're not made by the things that people know us for. Help me, Holy Ghost. We are made by the things that happen in secrecy. We're not made by the things that everybody knows about. We're made by the things that happen behind closed doors. People come to you right now and they look at you and they're so grateful that you are gifted and you are talented and they are, they are excited about what you can provide and they're excited about what they see and they're excited about what you become. But the truth is, where you are right now didn't make you. There are some little things that happened before today that makes you who you are. I tell you, this is an extraordinary, powerful story. This is a life-altering story. But I think the mistake that a lot of people make is they let the extraordinary moments of their life get all the attention. We, we want to pretend that, that where we are standing atop of our life is where we've always been, but is there anybody at home today that will be honest enough and say, Pastor, I wasn't made by where I am. Underneath this shirt are some scars and some bruises. Underneath my suit jacket, from underneath my tie, underneath my title, underneath all of the things that I got going on in my life, behind the steering wheel of my car and behind uh, the plush bed in my room and behind the expensive sofa that I sit on is somebody who was born in a struggle. Help me, Holy Ghost. 
There is another side of my story. And I tell you that, that we've got all of these superlatives in our life where, where we, we want to be known for our bigness. We often talk about the time that we scored the touchdown, but we don't talk about the time that we dropped the ball. We brag about scoring 20 points and 15 rebounds, but we don't tell anybody about the time when we missed every shot and didn't get a rebound and fouled out in the second quarter. We tell everybody about the hole in one, but we don't tell anybody about the time we scored 101. We, we, we often brag about, about all of the things that we have. We brag about the degree, but we don't brag when we drop out. We, we brag about graduating, but we don't brag about failing. We brag about depositing checks, but we don't brag when, when, when the bank is taking NSF fees out of the bank. We brag about the car that goes uh, up to 160 seconds, but we don't brag about having a bus pass. But the truth is, if it wasn't any struggle, there wouldn't be any strength. If you, didn't, if, you didn't, if you didn't cry, you wouldn't know that God could wipe tears away. Had you never struggled, you wouldn't know that he's a heavy load sharer. I'm trying to get you to the place where you put your big moments in the backdrop and start calling your smaller moments to the forefront and recognizing that it was your struggle. Help me, Holy Ghost. It was your struggle that gave you strength. You can brag about your Ferrari and that it has 600 horsepower underneath the hood. But what good is it without a steering wheel? Yeah, because it's, it's not the big things. It, it is, it's the little things. It's not the door that you need to thank for keeping you safe. It's that little dead boat lock. You, you, you thank God for a strong door, but what about the hinges? Yeah, it's, it's the small things. It's the small things. You, you hear this speaker right now, and you hear me uh, uh, online right now, and, and I've got this microphone with a pack on my back, and there are speakers all over the place, and, and I'm patched in to you. But don't you know that the only reason why you're able to hear me is because of one little small connection, one little small wire, and one little small plug, and that little thing never gets any of the credit, all we want to do, and some of you all will be typing, I can't hear the sound, or, or they need to turn it up, or they need to turn it down. See, all of that is relying on one small connection, because we often pay attention to the sound, but we don't pay attention to the connection, because we like to focus on the big things, but we don't like to focus on the small things. The cellular phone that you're holding in your hand right now, thank God that it is big enough for you to see the screen, but if it wasn't for a small SIM card, help me, Holy Ghost. If it wasn't for a small SIM card, you wouldn't even be able to have the memory to go back and look at pictures that have been on your phone from years past. Why? Because it is the small things. It's, it's the small things. It's, it's the little moments uh, that, that give us our big breakthroughs. And I think it's time that we start calling our little moments to the forefront and to the spotlight. I thank God for Houston, Texas. I thank God for the Lighthouse Church and and I'm looking in this sanctuary right now, and all we have in here is just the staff that's helping me produce this message right now. There are thousands of empty seats. There are thousands of empty seats. There is, there is uh, uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of, of square feet of empty space all around this place. And we've got a parking lot that could have six, seven hundred cars on one side and another five hundred cars on the other side. And to my right, we're building a 40,000 square foot building right now for children. And, and we've got stuff everywhere. We've got 30 acres out here. And, and, and I'm standing on this stage right now that's bigger than the original church that I used to preach in, preaching to some of you all over the world and, 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 and preaching to you in Africa and in London and in Australia and all over the United States of America. And I thank God for it that, that sometimes when I leave here, uh, I've, I've got volunteers who will help me drive, and, and we've got people who, for the staff who've been up here all day, who cook food for us, and, and, and we thank God for that, and we've got people who will help this and help that, and we've got a sound man back there, and we've got somebody doing sign language back there, and we've got cameramen all over the place, and we've got campus pastors all over the place. Thank God for Houston, because people know me all over the world because of what I've done in Houston, Texas, but I don't say this to be mean, and I don't say it to be aloof, but I want to tell you, Houston didn't make me. 
If you want to know what made me, you got to go back to a small town called Gary, Indiana, where only 80,000 people live. You got to go back to that 600 bedroom apartment where my mama fed us Taco Bell every single day. If you want to find out what made me, you got to go back to the apartment where we didn't have air conditioning, where we didn't have uh, uh, any way uh, to wash the dishes other than to put them in the sink, no dishwasher. If you want to find out what made me, you can't look at my front loader, washing machine and dryer. You got to go find me where I had to take a dollar fifty and go down to the laundromat and wash my clothes but didn't have enough money to dry them and had to carry them home in the winter and the clothes were frozen before we got home because they were wet. If you want to find out what made me, I want you to go look at my bus pass. Go find out when my mama didn't have a car. I want you, if you want to find out what made us, I want you to go look in the refrigerator when the only thing in there was a light bulb and, and some baking soda that was supposed to take smell out. But how you got a smell in the refrigerator, ain't no food in it. What, 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 I, you want to find out what made me? You want to find out what made me? I'm going to tell you what made me when I used to say he died on Friday in the laundromat with three people be between the rinse cycle and the wash cycle. And I had to hear quarters going down the Pepsi machine clinking at the bottom of a metal tin right during my message. You want to know what made me when I had 17 people in church on Easter Sunday morning? You want to know what made me? I was made in a building where you could fit everything that was in the building on this stage. I want you to stop acting like that where you are is where you've always been. You need to go back and appreciate those small moments. You need to go back and appreciate the times that you didn't have enough. Why? Because God makes men in the dark. He makes us in tough situations and circumstances. What made me is being raised by a single mother who did not have access to a father to help me to know how to be a man, but somehow was able to do it on her own. I was not made in Houston, Texas. I was not made at the Lighthouse Church. I was made in East Chicago, Indiana, in Gary, Indiana, where we had nothing but 250 seats in the building, and that was including 100 chairs that we had to borrow from another church on Easter Sunday morning. But there was only about 50 people there every Sunday after that. That's what made me. And the truth is, your highfalutin job and your window office and your Bentley and your Mercedes and your Cadillac did not make you. You were made when you didn't know where you were going to get the money from. You were made when you didn't know how to make ends meet. David was made in a field. He was not made in the palace. He was only able to do what he did on top because he didn't fall apart when he was on the bottom. And I talked to somebody who's watching me in here today. Despise not the days of your small beginnings. You don't understand that, yes, I grew up in the projects, but because it was because God was showing me that I was going to own my own project. Yes, I grew up in a small house because when I grow up, I'm going to start flipping smaller houses. It, everything that I grew up, it was good that I was afflicted, that I might learn. You were learning in your fields. Saul, shut your mouth. Saul assumed that his doubt would translate into David's defeat. And people wrongly imagine that where you will end up is a result of where they are. Listen, I don't want to interrupt the flow that we've got going on in the room, but this word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. There's a little giant inside of you, and by the end of the message, I want to make sure that that thing inside of you lives for, to its full potential. Now, we're getting ready to give, and I want you to understand that giving is not a debt that you owe. It's just a seed that you sow. God is so good that even in a pandemic, we are still abounding in his grace. I want you to consider being generous. We're getting ready to put some stuff at the bottom of the screen that will tell you exactly how to do it. You can give on our website. You can give on our app. And for those of you all who are members of our Lighthouse 2.0, you can give through Givelify. So listen, I want you to give as God has blessed you. We're going to continue to do the mission work of the Lord, but I got to get back to this word. Stay tuned and I'll greet you at the end. What, what bothers me is that everybody is afraid of their past. Everybody's embarrassed by where they came from. You better go back and grab that power and recycle it and use it because David was able to beat Goliath. Now I'm in the text. He was able to beat Goliath off of recycled power. He was able to beat Goliath off of recycled power. If, if Goliath was his first fight, I don't think he would have made it. If Lighthouse was my first church, in the words of Marvin Sapp, I never would have made it. I, I didn't know. 
I had never pastored 10,000 people before. But I didn't learn how to pastor 10,000 people when we had 10,000 people. I learned how to pastor 10,000 people when I had five. I call that my lion and my bear experience. Yeah, David didn't knock Goliath out because this wasn't his first fight. He didn't knock Goliath out because he was that strong of a warrior and he was just good and beginner's luck. No, he was able to do it because he has some small fights. You may be looking at me right now saying, Pastor, I've been watching you preach for a long time. I've never seen you sweat that bad in my life. Let me tell you why we're sweating. As we're building this building, they had to, to, to disconnect the electrical system in order to bury the new wires underneath the foundation. So here we are right now in Houston, Texas, where it's 100 degrees when you wake up in the morning, 190 when you go out, and 120 when you go to bed at night. Here we are in Houston, Texas at the Lighthouse Church, and I am sweating while I'm preaching to you because it's 110 degrees in this building. And there is no air condition. And I'm still doing it. Why? Because my first church didn't have air condition. Help me, Holy Ghost. My first church didn't have air condition. They called me this morning and told me, you need to stay home, Pastor, because there is no air in the building. And they don't want you hot. But see, that's people who met me in Houston. If they had met me where I came from, they would understand that I preached for years with no air condition. They would understand that I know what it's like to preach the gospel with no air condition. They would know that I've done it before. And if I've done it before, I can do it again. I'm here. Not because of my big moments. I'm here because of my small moments. I'm sweating for you because I know what it feels like. I'm doing it right now because I understand I don't have to be comfortable to do my call. I don't need air conditioning to preach to you. I don't need electricity to preach to you. All I need is the Holy Ghost. So I'm in this building today because of my little moments. And if you got to watch me sweat, you're going to watch me sweat. But if you've known me for the last 20 years, you know this is how I started. I started with empty buildings. I don't need nobody in the room. I've been preaching to empty buildings all my life. I ain't had full, full rooms until this part of my life. This is a new thing for me. That's why it doesn't make me. I'm not made by full sanctuaries. I was bred in empty rooms. That's why I'm okay. That's why I'm able to do it today. That's why I'm preaching with five people in a big room right now. Because I am not defined by my Goliaths. It was my lions and my bears. That made me, and I'm like David. I'm like David. I'm going to beat this Goliath. He's going to fall. Why? Because you missed my private moment. Can I tell you something? You are not ready to win publicly until you can handle being fought privately. David was able to fight Goliath in front of everybody because he defeated a lion and bear in front of nobody. And let me tell you right now, the battles that make you are not the ones that people see. The battles that make you are the ones that don't nobody see. I'm talking about that depression don't nobody know nothing about. I'm talking about that insecurity that you're struggling with. I'm talking about that porn addiction that you got. You know the one that don't nobody know nothing about? That's okay because God knows all about it. And there is something being bred in you and there is a strength being bred in you right now that when you come out, you're going to be able to fight your Goliath because you did not let your lion and your bear defeat you. So I'm sweating. And so I'm hot. But I ain't been in the building with air conditioning but for six years. <laughs> the first 19 years of my ministry was in the heat. The first 19 years of my ministry was in empty rooms. So I had to fight my lion and I had to fight my bear. Why do you think David was so good at a slingshot. Do you think it was beginner's luck that he just wound it up and hit Goliath in the center of the head? Beginner's luck? No, he had experience with that thing. In fact, on one case, the Bible says that he defeated one of the animals with his bare hands. That he grabbed one of them by the beard and dragged him to the ground and smote him and slew him. Why do you think he was so successful against Goliath? <laughs> because... David appreciated the little giant inside of him. So we often assume, we often assume that David was made in the valley of Elah while he was fighting the giant. I'm telling you right now, David was a made man before he got there. David had already been in the lineup and overlooked. David had already been rejected by his own father. 
David had already been overlooked by a taller, more handsome candidate by the prophet Samuel. David knew exactly what it was to be an underdog. He, he knew exactly what it was to be made fun of. He was just like Danny in the story of the little giants. He was smaller. He was more, he was less experienced. He had more folly. The Bible says that he was ruddy. His hair was red. He had freckles on his face, but didn't nobody know that in that little man was a big giant. In fact, I'm telling you, even though he was shorter than his battle, he was bigger than his foe. He was shorter than the thing he was looking at. But it ain't the size of the man in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the man. It ain't the size of the woman in the struggle. It's the size of the struggle in the woman. What do you have inside of you that you can access when you're facing something outside of you? David dug in deep. And when he looked that giant in the face, he says to the giant, I'm not going to lose this battle, number one, because Saul didn't give me credit. Help me, Holy Ghost. The Bible says that Saul looked at David and originally tried to keep him from fighting. The Bible says that Saul says, I'm, I'm not, Pastor Raymond, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to let you fight Goliath. You're going to lose. You're going to lose. You don't have any experience. You, you, don't, you don't have any credentials. I'm not, I'm not going to let you fight him. There is no way you can come out of this on top. The truth is, follow me, the truth is, Saul was afraid of Goliath. And because he was afraid of Goliath, he didn't let David fight him. Here's what the Lord showed me. Are you ready for this? He assumed that his doubt would translate into David's defeat. <laughs> he thought that because he couldn't do it, and he's head and shoulders above everybody else, if he couldn't do it, surely the little giant can't do it. Are you ready? Because I'm about to set you free. Often people wrongly imagine where you will end up because of where they are. Mm. I got to say that again. I got to say it again. People often discount you because they have discouraged themselves. So he thought, if somebody my size can't do it, then surely somebody your size can't do it. If I was there with David, I would say, David, I got this. Uh, Mr. Saul, greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. It is not the size of what you are looking at that will determine if I win this battle. Because what I have that's going to help me win this battle is not what you see. It is what's inside of me that you cannot see. And I prophesy to every one of you watching today that there is a giant inside of you that is able to defeat everything that's staring you down. You got to stop looking for your power outside of you. Help me, Holy Ghost. And you got to start to understand that there is something inside of you that even though it's invisible, it is indestructible. It is, there is something big inside of you. If you would just tap into it. You could tell the giant of rejection, the giant of defeat, the giant of insecurity, the giant of depression, the giant of addiction. You could sit them all down at the feet of the giant will you have inside of you. David said, <laughs> oh, you don't know me. Once I killed a lion and a bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine that y'all got, ain't going to be long before he befalls the same thing as my other battles. What Saul didn't know is that David had recycled power. What am I talking about? What, what do I mean, recycled power? See, to recycle means to reprocess, to reclaim, and to recover something already used and convert it into something useful. 
See, and when you recycle something, it's already been used, it's already been tossed, it's already been thrown away. But David shows us that you can use old power in a new battle. He's, he's not learning how to fight Goliath while he's fighting Goliath. He's got some old stuff back here that, that he's used before when he was fighting the lion and the bear. And he goes back and he accesses what he usually has. Now, now one thing I've learned about God is that God is also a recycler. Yeah, God, God is a recycler. Go, go to John chapter 6, verse 12. Jesus says to the disciples after they feed the crowd, he says, pick up the scraps so that nothing will be wasted. See, here's the problem with most of us. We lose our battles because we don't pick up the scraps. We, we lose our fights because we don't pick up the scraps. We, we, want, we want the one hit a quitter. We want the knockout punch. But you don't knock a championship fighter out with one punch. You knock him out with consistent jabs. You're not going to knock the devil out with one punch. But if you pray and pray and pray and pray and fast and pray and fast and pray, eventually he will fall under the pressure of your little efforts. The Bible says wealth is built little by little. The Bible says that that the ant is, is powerful. He, 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 he's a little creature, but he can carry something four or five times his weight because he's a little thing. You got to understand that the Saul in your life, and many of you have Saul's in your life right now, and I, I want you to stop listening to him because the Saul's in your life will make you believe that you can't because they won't. <laughs> stop letting negative people who don't believe in themselves talk you out of believing in you there is a giant inside of you bigger than the giant outside of you and if you keep letting Saul tell you I wouldn't start that business if you let Saul tell you I wouldn't take that if I was you if you let Saul keep telling you you can't win this battle you will lose the very thing that God has beset before you and you will miss the blessings of your victory because you let Saul talk you out of your situation. I want you to silence every Saul in your life. I want you to silence every, every voice, every voice from your past that told you that you were not going to make it. Every voice in your past that told you that you were not smart enough. Every voice in your past that told you that you were not bright enough. Every voice in your past that told you that you were not going to make it. I want you to silence that voice. And do me a favor right now and say, Saul, shut up. <laughs> Tell Saul to shut up. Shut up. And, and, and that way, if it's your mama, you don't have to tell her to her face. And if it's your daddy, you don't have to tell him to his face. And if it's your negative sister, that because she light-skinned and thinks she's pretty in you because you're dark-skinned. Or if it's somebody in your family who thinks because they grew up in a big house and you grew up in the hood, they were better than you. I want you to silence your Saul right now and say, shut up, Saul. You don't understand that, yes, I grew up in the projects, but because it was because God was showing me that I was going to own my own project. Yes, I grew up in a small house because when I grow up, I'm going to start flipping smaller houses. Everything that I grew up, it was good that I was afflicted, that I might learn. You were learning in your fields. Saul, shut your mouth. Saul assumed that his doubt would translate into David's defeat, and people wrongly imagine that where you will end up is a result of where they are. Saul didn't know that David had some recycled resolve. <laughs> David, when he got ready to fight Goliath, David said, uh, excuse me, everybody. No need to panic. <laughs> no, no need to worry. I, I got this. Uh, what you don't know is just not too long ago, I was out tending my father's sheep. Saul, I'm talking to you. Yeah, I know you think I'm going to lose, but let, let me just give you my credentials. Since you wouldn't give me credit, I'm going to give you my credentials. Since you wouldn't give me credit, I'm going to give you my credentials. Let, let, let me let you know what set I'm claiming. Let, let me tell you where I came from. Uh, I used to watch my father's sheep. And um, when I was watching my father's sheep not too long ago, uh, a lion and a bear came by. Um, 
And all I had was a little slingshot, but I didn't want to use it. I used my bare hands on one of them jokers because I, I get down like that. Uh, let me tell you, they came and uh, one of them jokers had the nerve to bite my daddy's sheep and carry it away in its mouth. Oh, and let me tell you what happened. When it bit the sheep and carried it in its mouth, I was on it like white on rice, got the sheep out of the bear or the lion's mouth before it killed it, and then killed the thing that bit my father's sheep. Oh my God. I want you to get that. I want you to get it. Because if, if, if it bit the sheep, if the lion bit the sheep and carried it away, and David was able to get there before it was dead, that means that David was on it quick. And he was able to get the sheep out of the lion's mouth and killed it. Now you got to understand, he's a shepherd. This is his job. His daddy said, boy, you got to defend these sheep with your life. I want you to understand, we can't take a loss. This is hard times. We got to make sure that we got all we got and keep all we can and can all we get. Can you do it, boy? David said, daddy, I got you. And that lion came and took away the sheep in his mouth. And David killed it. He lived to tell the story. For lions are more powerful than men. And David should have been dead fooling around with that lion. But he lived. And he showed me something. That you're not ready to be king until you can stay alive in somebody else's mouth. <laughs> Most people, as soon as somebody says something about us, we die. As soon as they gossip about us, we fall apart. As soon as they say something about us, we're ready to fight. But David shows us that you got to be able to get yourself out of your lion's mouth. You got to be able to get your destiny out of the lion's mouth. You're not ready to be king until you can survive in somebody else's mouth. I know that's a word for somebody right now because the devil is vexing you. You're not ready to own a company until you can handle being lied on as an employee. You, you're, not, you're not ready. You're not ready. If you can't survive on your current level, don't ask God for the next level because you got to learn to survive where you are before you can ask God to take you where you want to be. David went over there and killed that lion. And let me tell you something about David. David, is, he's one heck of a man because he is not the only person in the Bible that has killed a lion. We know Samson killed a lion as well. But David said, man, let me give you my credentials. Yeah, y'all go ahead and talk about Samson. I know, I know he pushed the building down with his two hands and all that kind of stuff, but I'm the only dude on record known for killing a lion and a bear at the same time. Now, you, 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 can't, you can't doubt that. Those are my credentials. Those are my credentials. I, I, I killed a lion and a bear at the same time. And, and, and that's, that's, th those are my credentials. So, so you can doubt me if you want, but, but I'm not fighting Goliath with giant tactics. I got, a, I got some little stuff back here, some recycled power, some, some energy and some tactics that I learned in the field when nobody was watching. I learned some stuff when nobody was watching. And I'm telling you right now, the reason why you're going to win your next battle is because you're going to rely on the prayer that you prayed when nobody was watching. Why is quarantine so important? Because you're learning some stuff in your house right now you weren't going to learn at church. You're learning some things right now in quarantine that you would not have learned in your going out. You're learning some things in isolation that you would not have learned in socialization. Let me tell you that God is teaching you some things alone that you're going to need along the way. That there is a giant inside of you that can handle the giant outside of you. Goliath, you big, you big, but this ain't my first rodeo. Goliath, you big, but this ain't my first fight. Lighthouse, you hot, but I done done this before. It's warm, but I've done this before. I'm sweating, but I've done this before. Somebody ought to say, I'm broke, but I've been here before. I'm struggling, but I've been here before. I'm depressed, but I've been here before. I've been rejected, but I've been here before. 
And if God did it before, you ought to slap somebody and tell him he can do it again. I dare you tell everybody in your house, if he did it before, he can do it again. If he got us out of bankruptcy before, he can get us out of bankruptcy again. This is the first time that the church has been under scrutiny. This is the first time that our economy has been shaky. But if God can do it in 1936 and in 1932, he can do it in 2020 because if he's done it before, he can do it again. Somebody ought to shout encore. I speak an encore in your life that God is about to redo it, reclaim it, reset it, and recycle it in your life today. To watch this, David says, I, I got this. I got this. I got this. I got this. You know why I'm not depressed? Because of what Saul said? You know why what came out of Saul's mouth? You know why it's not bothering me? You want to know these insults that Goliath is hurling at me? You want to know why they're not bothering me? So I've already seen down the mouth of a lion and survived that. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me. See, you, I just want to take a little praise break right here because you keep on talking about what you're struggling with and what, what, you, what you're needing to come through. And what, but, but can you just spend about 30 seconds thanking God for what he's already done? Can you just spend a few moments thanking him for what he's brought you out of, for the danger seen and unseen, and for how he's brought you over and through and under and out? Oh, what a mighty God we serve. Heaven adores him and angels bow before him. So David's like, yeah, he might be nine feet, but he don't compare to my spiritual giant. I got some recycle power. I, I can convert lion fighting and bear fighting into giant fighting because I've got recycle power. David, David shows us something. And this is something I want you to know, that God develops us in our fields before he makes us famous. Yeah. You can't just step out on the stage of life and say, Goliath, here I am, without proving yourself in the field. See, this, this is my Goliath. And I wish I could go back and show you a picture of my lion and my bear. I wish I could go back and show you how the first service we had was in a two-bedroom house in Fort Wayne, Indiana, in the living room of a lady named Saloni Mayhill, who had a, a brown leather lazy boy rocking chair and a couch up against the wall, and how our church started with five people all over the age of 72. And I wish I could show you how Saloni Mayhill had a daughter who worked down at the local daycare center in and allowed us to go down to the daycare center and start to have church on Sunday and how a man named Rob Ryder rented me two 15-inch speakers and one microphone with a cord on it for $200 a month and he brought it over every Sunday and the deal was in order for us not to pay our $65 a week in rent I had to come in on Saturday and clean up all of the nasty diapers and clean up all of the bathrooms so that we didn't have to have rent and I wish I can tell you that after that, that we finally got our money together and we got $5,000 together and went down to a local church called Eagle's Nest and we got that church building and, uh, and then we were able to buy that building and, and the building was about 110 years old. And, and in order to keep the building from leaking, we had to scrape the paint off and paint it every three months so that the people would know that the building was leaking. And how one day I went to a conference in California and came back to the church. And that there were 10, it was 10 feet of water in the basement of the church because the church had flooded. And how we had to have fans blowing underneath the carpet because there wasn't no such thing as getting somebody to come out and deal with mildew. We had mildew in the building. We had mold in the building. But we also had the power of the Holy Ghost. And we didn't have any air conditioning. We didn't have any heat. And so when it was cold, it was cold. And when it was hot, it was hot. And I wish I could tell you that when we finally did get some real money, we put $40,000 together. 
put the down payment on a church building and had a $936 mortgage. And we had that church on two acres and it sat 125 people and we packed it out three times a day and we kept going and we kept going. And when we finally got blessed, we were able to put two window units in the wall and we had air conditioned finally after a few years of church. But we kept on pushing and we kept pushing and we only had enough room in the parking lot for 20 cars and we kept pushing and we kept pushing. And I finally was able to get an office and I put a TV tray in the office with a fold-out chair, and that was my first desk. And right now, I still have that fold-out tray in the theater room at my house to remind me where I came from. Why? Because this pulpit didn't make me. I was made before I got here. I am preaching on recycled anointing. I'm preaching on recycled power. I was made in the struggle. I was made in darkness. I was made in cold rooms. I was made in hot circumstances. And the reason why I don't complain about it in 2020 is because I survived it in 2020. I survived it in 1999. I survived it in 2001. I survived it in 2002. I survived it in 2003. I've been here my whole life. If you would go back over your life and think things over, you should be able to truly say that I've been blessed. I've got a testimony. How many of y'all got a testimony? You ain't always lived in those suburbs. Stop being brand new. Your car ain't always had a push-button start. Stop being brand new. You ain't always had power seats. You used to have to reach under that seat and grab that bar and slide yourself up. You know the truth. You ain't always had no electric windows. Some of y'all remember having to roll a window up like that, and if you was broke like we was, you had to put pliers on it because the handle had broke off. You, you don't remember the day where you had to have one of the, one of the ice uh, picks inside the car because it would freeze on the inside too. Help me, Holy Ghost. You, you don't remember having to start your car up 15 minutes before you left so it could warm up. And you don't remember the day when we used to could break in our cars by putting a wire hanger in between the window to pull the lock up. Don't act like you always had Comcast cable. You remember them bunny ears, them rabbit ears? Well, you had two, five, and seven. You remember TV used to click. I remember the day when my granddaddy had a Curtis Mathis. That's one of them big old wooden TVs on, on the ground, but it didn't work no more. So he put a tablecloth on it and put a TV on top of the TV. That's why I was made. That, that, that's why I was made. I, I was made drinking water. Y'all brand new. You got to have, and I'm like it too. We all brand new. We're drinking bottled water in Fiji, but I remember drinking out the water hose. That's why I was made. That's why I was made. When my mama put water in the tub, and all of us had to take a bath in the same water. That's where I was made. I, I was made off of frying bologna. I, I, I was made off of Roman noodles. I, I, I was made uh, off of making Kool-Aid. Let me tell you, all you little young Thundercats making Kool-Aid with cold water, you don't know what you're doing. You're supposed to make it with warm water so the sugar can melt. I wish I could come help you, but I ain't got enough time for all that today. But he, 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 you're made by your credentials. You're made by your credentials. You're made by where you came from. You're made. You're made by, I, I remember having to walk a mile to school in the winter to be able to get on the bus before it was full, before it got in front of our apartment. That, that, that's, where, that's where I was made. So all this nice weather down here in Houston, when, when people can't come to church because it's raining, Come to Indiana where it's five feet of snow on the ground and tell me whether we still went to church. That's, that's why I was made. Help me, Holy Ghost. That, that, that's why I was made. I, I didn't have a beach 45 minutes away. Didn't have a house with, with multiple levels and heating and cooling zones. And you can heat this part of the house up to this if you're uncomfortable and put the downstairs at it. No, I, I was made where everybody in the house had to be the same temperature. And that temperature was regulated by my mama. And if mama didn't have no money, that means we had to be hot or cold. I was made where well, you couldn't just open the refrigerator and look in it and stare in it and keep it open. I was raised in a house where your mind needed to be made up before you got to the refrigerator with permission to open it and out of it in five seconds before mama tell you, I ain't trying to air condition the whole house, close my refrigerator. I was made where mama had to open the stove to heat the house. Oh, God. Y'all don't, don't know what I'm talking about. That, that's... That's why I was made. Well, we had to boil the water before we drank it because we had lead in our soil two inches beneath the ground. That's where 
I was made where when we heard gunshots, we had to get on the ground because we had heard stories about people who had been killed with stray bullets. I was made in a moment where the first person in my life that was murdered was in the sixth grade with me and he was in class on a Tuesday and wasn't there on a Wednesday and we saw his blood stained on the concrete and we walked past it. That's where I was made. So don't think that I'll get here and act funny and don't you get where God has you and get to acting funny because your car starts up every time you push the button and you've got air conditioned central air and HVAC in your house. Remember where he has brought you from. I shall never forget where he has brought me where he's brought me from. So the reason why today in 2020, people have been checking on me, trying to find out how I've been handling my Goliath. And they can't figure out why I'm able to stand up to my Goliath. The reason why I'm still standing up to my Goliath is I'm using recycled power. I've been here before. I have fought my lion and my bear. And I am using the energies that God has placed in me deep down inside of me from moments past. And you don't have to worry about anybody who has any experience with God. I want you to know that God told me to tell you to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And if you have done it before, you can do it again. I dare you to act like you are in a sanctuary right now and begin to shout in your house and say, God, I'm going to use recycled resolve to win this battle. I got to let y'all go. I came to tell you. Don't you let anything go to waste. Stop trying to forget where you came from. It's the little giant that's going to give you the big win. <clears throat> it's the small things that you've been through that's going to help you make it to where you're going. You know, I want to show you something about what God is doing with what you've been experiencing in your life. You see, many of you, when you go outside and you drive by roads, you see trees. They're beautiful. They got roots, barks, branches, leaves. But this thing started out as a seed. It started out as a seed, converted into paper, recycled into baskets, weak enough to fold, strong enough to sustain. Can be fashioned to carry Fashioned to carry you. All from this. See, in its raw state, in its original state, you never know what it can be. But when God gets a hold of you, When he starts to fashion you, you don't know whether you'll be paper. You don't know whether you will be a bench. You don't know whether you will be a basket. I don't know what you're going to be. But whatever you become, you will be perfectly you. But I want to tell you to get from here to here got to be cut. To get from here to here, you got to go through process. When they told me today, Pastor, we can't have church because there's no power, there's no power, there's no air condition. I called the team, I said, can y'all stay? Ricky said, yeah. I said, I'm on my way. Because I'm not here anymore. I'm here. I know my purpose. I've been through my process. I've been through my pain. It's fashioned me to be who I am. 
no amount of heat was going to keep me from giving you fire. So if I had to sweat, I could say like Jesus, I have sweat that you may have life and have that life more abundantly. Little giant, survive. Little giant, fight. Little giant, persevere. Little giant, never give up. Little giant, build yourself up in your most holy faith. Don't let Saul's doubt manifest into your doubt. Don't let Saul's fear translate into your defeat. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And God will. I said God will. I know he will take care of you. That's not an antidote. That's experience. My mother used to say, you got to know that you know that you know you know. Would you do me a favor? Would you repeat after me, Lord Jesus? I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and I believe in my heart that God has raised his son from the dead I accept you in my heart as my Lord and Savior I confess now that I want salvation if you said that and you believe it we believe you've been born again I want you to connect with us and I want you to walk this faith journey with us because it is my job to help you to discover the little giant that's inside of you. Be blessed. Man, what an amazing word by our pastor, Pastor Keon Henderson. I hope it was life changing for you as it was for me. Listen, if you did not have the opportunity earlier to give, we have four ways to give on the screen. We want to thank you for your continuous support for those that are just, not even just our members, but those that are actually visiting through our website. We thank you. But listen, stop. What you doing? Take a break. We want to talk to you about salvation. Romans 10 and 9 said, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I want you to know there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. There's no, nothing in your past, there's nothing that even you did this morning that will disqualify you from receiving salvation. So listen, I want you to take this moment, close your eyes, and hear God clearly, because we want to make sure that before this is done, we thank you. The giving is great, the worship is great, the word is great, but if you don't receive Christ, all of it was in vain. All it takes is one, and we want you to step into the membership of eternal life. So just take that moment, receive him. We got a number on the screen. People are waiting to pray with you. For, and if you wanna join our ministry, not just become a member of heaven, but even become a member of the Lighthouse Church, we have people standing by to give you information on how you can do that. All that should be on the screen. Now listen, if you haven't already, make sure you like this, share this, repost it on your Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, whatever. Be sure to catch the replay. It's one thing to hear it one time, but when you really hear it the second time, you can really digest it. Can I pray for you real quick? God, we thank you for this wonderful word that was given on today. I pray a special prayer over those that have received Christ in this moment, God. I pray that you would give them clarity, wisdom, God. I pray that you would give them discipline, but most importantly, God, surround them with people that can pour into them even in their, in their babe in Christ. God, we thank you for all those that attended the service. We thank you for all those that will watch this later on. And God, we pray a special blessing over those who are dealing with family members that might have fallen into this pandemic issues. 
But God, we know that you're a healer in all capacities. So we thank you and we love you. Amen. Catch y'all next week. See you Tuesday. Peace.